Good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of our virtual Sunday School class. Today's lesson is from Derby to Philippi. And it is the from the fall quarter, lesson number 11. And reading the scriptures, we have two sections of scriptures. Uh, the first one, Acts 16, 1 through 4. And it reads as follows. Then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered from the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders that were at Jerusalem. And then the other section of scriptures from Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 8 through 15. And they passed by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding, abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside which prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart of the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things that were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now the title of today's lesson is From Derby to Philippi. And one of the principal uh, characters in today's lesson is the young man, Timothy. And we know that Timothy and Paul became extremely close during Paul's ministry. We know in Timothy, the second Timothy 3, 10 through 11, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. So later in life, when Paul is talking to Timothy, he reminds Timothy that Timothy was actually privy. He had actually was there for a lot of these events of Paul's life, events of his ministry. 
And we may, it may have also been that uh, Timothy was a member of that group of disciples that surrounded the apparently, apparent lifeless body uh, of the apostle outside the walls of Lystra, where people thought that Paul was actually, um, was actually had been killed. So Timothy, uh, as I said, Timothy was a very important um, part of Paul's ministry. Timothy had been with Paul through a lot of uh, trying times, a lot of victories, a lot of periods where uh, Paul had things revealed to him, uh, where uh, God had opened up doors for Paul, where people had come against Paul. Timothy had been there, and Paul had nurtured and mentored Timothy. There was more than just a mere... Um, a mere professional relationship between Paul and Timothy. I think back to uh, uh, one of my pastors, recent pastors, uh, who has gone on to be with the Lord now, Brother James Ford. And Brother Ford, uh, he and I had gotten real close. And it began to be more than just a mere the man who pastored the church where I was attending. It was more like Brother Ford became like an uncle to me. Um, and, I, and I grew very close to Brother Ford and he, he to I. And, and he, it, it uh, meant a lot for the times of mentoring and instruction that I got from him. It was like getting uh, instruction from an older, uh, from an uncle who would take you under his wing and show you various things and tell you various things. And, and, and you appreciate that. And they are some people that you meet in your life and in your ministry where you have that special relationship where you become more like actual kinfolk than just people that you go to church with. And that was the relationship that Paul and Timothy, the kind of relationship that they had. Well, going back and going through this verse by verse, Acts the 16th chapter, verse 1, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek. And uh, we want to notice that interjection of behold. And um, that is the way that Luke draws attention to this moment, to this meeting, to show you the importance of that meeting. So there's special significance in that word, behold, because it is underscoring that this is an important relationship and this is an important stage in this story. And I also, too, want to discuss a little bit about uh, that phrase, but his father was a Greek. And that underscores the fact that Timothy's father was a, an uncircumcised Greek. And apparently he had remained an uncircumcised Greek. And that's the reason why, pa, why Timothy had not been circumcised. We can infer from this that Timothy's father, even though he was married to a Jewish woman, Timothy's father was not a prosel proselyte. He had not tried to be converted to Judaism. That, that he was um, merely just a Gentile Greek. He married this Jewish woman and he had not 
taken on her faith, he still was a Greek. And we know from natural history, from the discussions that uh, rabbis would have with each other, that Jewish women, even though their sons as being the the child of a Jewish woman, if the Greek, the Gentile husband refused to have his son circumcised, Jewish women were not to go against that Gentile husband. And being an obedient, in the culture, being an obedient wife of the day, uh, Timothy's mother did not go against his Gentile father, and have him circumcised. So Timothy, that is the reason why Timothy at this late stage in his life, although his mother was a Jewish woman, Timothy had not been circumcised. Okay, then going down to the second verse, which was well reported of by the brethren that were in Lystra, in Iconium. Now, we want to point out there's two ways that verse can be interpreted uh, and, and tell you how I think it should be interpreted. There's two ways that can be interpreted where it says, but his father was a Greek. And then the second verse it says, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Now you can in, you can interpret that that Timothy's father was a Greek, but he was well thought of, well considered among the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. That would be one way you could interpret that. That is not the way that I interpret that. I think that that verse is actually especially taken into consideration uh, that uh, there's no mention of, of Timothy's father being a Christian, just that he is a pagan Greek. Um, the way I interpret that is, is that that which was well reported of by the brethren to be referring back to Timothy and not his father. But you could, theoretically, you could interpret that either way, but it makes more sense with the other facts we know about Timothy's life and that relationship he had in his family. It makes a lot more sense to me that the well-reported of is referring to Timothy and not his father. We see no uh, bad things said about Timothy's father. We just see that his father is referred to as simply a Greek. Okay, going down to the third verse. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now, if remembering back to our lesson last week, or maybe week before last, talking about the church council and talking back to how that they had held the church council and had decided that Gentiles do not have to be uh, converted to Judaism to become Christians, it may seem a little strange at this point that Paul took and circumcised Timothy. But now, Timothy was a little bit of a different situation. He was a little bit of a different situation than what we had when the Gentiles were being converted to Christianity. Timothy was a little bit of a situ different situation because he was genetically a Jew. And by a lot of Jewish considerations, should have been 
circumcised and to be held accountable to the law. There could have been a big debate made about that. That as a genetic Jew, he was supposed to be circumcised. That this is a violation of the law because he is of the seed of Abraham and he has not been circumcised. And so, there could have been a lot of contention over that. And this is a different, a truly, it is a different situation than when a Gentile was being converted to Christianity. It is a different situation than that. Because, see, these people were not Gentiles. Those of us who are Gentiles, we are not of the seed of Abraham. We were not in that group that was commanded to be circumcised and not of the natural seed of Abraham. So we can be circumcised or not be circumcised and not be in violation of that direct command of God to be circumcised as being the seed of Abraham. And if you remember back to the story of Moses, Moses was actually forced to circumcise his sons. He had let it go on too long, and he was forced to circumcise his, circumcise his son. The great lawgiver Moses uh, had let that slide, and he was forced to circumcise his sons. So uh, a strong argument could have been made against Timothy being uncircumcised. So to keep that down, Paul went ahead and circumcised Timothy. And I'm sure that was a uncomfortable situation for Timothy. And we don't want to uh, interject or make too many conjecture, but uh, from grown men are circumcised, our young boys are circumcised uh, past the stage of a baby. Uh, it is an extremely uncomfortable situation, and uh, it was no small thing for Timothy to submit to this and be circumcised. But we see that that Timothy did. Okay, going down to the fourth verse. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them to the decrees. They delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So we see that this group, uh, as they went through from town to town, they brought these orders that were decided on uh, in Jerusalem by the apostles and the elders. And this word in Greek is ta dogmas and uh, dogmata. And we have, uh, uh, it's the same word that we get our word dogmatic. And we tend to now uh, use dogma in the sense of our creeds and what we believe in our statements of faith and that kind of thing. But back in the day, in the original language, in the original Greek, ta dogmata is used four times in the New Testament. It is Luke 2 and 1, where it talks about a decree from Caesar Augustus, Acts 17 and 7, the decrees of Caesar, and again in Ephesians 2.15 and Colossians 2.14. Now, generally speaking, though that ta dogmata, generally speaking, that was used for a law or an edict from a king or a legislative body. It was actually a rule. More than the way we use the, the word dogma now, 
to mean like a statement of faith. This is more. This was more used for. Um, it was used more for a rule. Um, for example, uh, the rule about the Gentiles being circumcised. That was a uh, decree, a ta dogmata, that they would be taking from city to city so churches would know how to act and behave in certain situations. Okay, then we go down to Acts, the 16th chapter, 8 through 11. And they passed by Mesia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come into Macedonia and to help us. And we see right before the text that we're reading today where it talks about the Spirit suffered them not. They intended to go in a certain direction and the Holy Ghost compelled them not to go in that direction. And then we see where Paul has this vision of a man from Macedonia. We are not told that it is uh, whether or not it was a dream or a vision, but he sees this man from Macedonia saying, Come, help us. And the way Paul was to was being compelled to come and help him was a uh, by preaching and praying and pulling down the strongholds of the devil because these people were suffering under the power of Satan. And this man from Macedonia that he sees says, Come and help us. Then coming down to the 10th verse, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And that call, that blessed call to preach the gospel, the, the compulsion that the Holy Ghost puts you under. Uh, I used to regret and resist that call, and I fought that call for a good number of years. But friends, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I wouldn't give anything for my call now. I am so thankful. I want to tell any young person that, the God, that God is calling into the ministry. I want to tell them there is no greater thing in my, that, there's no more blessed thing that you can spend your time doing is preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't regret a mile. I don't regret a thing. Not one ounce of my, from my calling. And, I, and for something that I resisted and fought against for so long, I am so thankful that I finally submitted to the hand of the Lord and began to do the calling of the Lord. There's no higher calling than to preach the gospel. And that's what they were called to do. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with straight course to Samothracia, and next day to Neapolis. Then going down to the 14th verse, from whence, no, going down, excuse me, to the 12th verse, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony and we were in that city abiding certain days. And we see that uh, uh, they were that this was listed also as a colony, not just a Greek city, but a colony of the Roman Empire, and that in, that conferred upon them the rights of of Roman citizenship uh, at that location. So the rule of law was a little bit better than what it would have been in other places because it was a colony of the Roman Empire. And then down to the 13th verse, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by a riverside 
where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which were sorted hither. And then we see there where was wont to be a uh, be a place of prayer. That word prosucha is uh, was a designation for a place where the Jewish people, if they did not have enough people there to be uh, to have a synagogue, they would have these temporary places of prayer. And that's what they're talking about where these women were gathered. They didn't have enough people there to make a synagogue, to hold a synagogue, because they needed ten families so they could support a rabbi. Because if everybody gave ten percent, then the rabbi would make about what uh, what the normal average salary was in the city, which is about what preachers should make. They should make about what the other people make in the church. They shouldn't make a lot less than the people in the church. They shouldn't make a lot more than the people in the church. It should be about the average salary of what's at a church. And that's the way synagogues were set up. That's why they had to have ten families. Um, but there wasn't enough people there to hold a synagogue, so they had this temporary uh, place of prayer in the original language called a prosucha, which was just like I said, a temporary place where they would have prayer. Then down to the 14th verse, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Terra Terra, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended into the things which was spoken of Paul. And we see that uh, um, that Lydia uh, was a worshiper of God. She had been, um, there's no guarantee that she was Jewish, but she was a believer in God and had worshipped and had a lot of respect for Jewish people. And she had attended these Jewish services. So we see that. And we also see that Lydia was a wealthy woman because this uh, purple, people who dealt in purple in that day, that's why purple was considered the royal color, because it was so astronomically expensive. And Lydia had been one of those people who dealt in the color purple. So she was very wealthy. Then down to the 15th verse, when, and when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now, I want to point out something, and she was baptized and her household. Now, people have used that verse to justify infant baptism, and there's nothing in that verse that says that the members of Lydia's household who were baptized were babies. They could have very well have all been of the age of accountability where they could have accepted the Lord themselves and they also got saved and they were baptized. So it's a real strain to try to use that verse to justify, to justify infant baptism. And, uh, and I believe everybody should be of the age of accountability and know enough to accept the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves before they are baptized and and brought into the church. That should be a uh, an act of their self. I mean, we stand on our own, and we fall by our own. If we sin, uh, it's our sin, and we can't go on our on our on our parents' righteousness. Uh, we can't. We are not judged by our parents' sin. It's every uh, every generation stands on its own two feet. Appreciate you listening in. And neighbor, you turn in next week for our virtual Sunday school class.